yes, we are ready actually to begin right now. Maybe let's just stall a bit for like this one minute for people to still join. But what you just mentioned, the distributed databases and Kubernetes, this is basically what this talk is about as well. So the title, it might actually sound a bit uh, long or uh, repelling. So in short, if we had to shorten the title, we could have actually also named it Kubernetes not equals Kubernetes. So what we'll talk a bit about is uh, how to build actually a managed database service across, first of all, on top of Kubernetes, but in particular across multiple cloud vendors. So um, we built actually our ArangoDB Oasis, which is a managed cloud service for ArangoDB across multiple managed Kubernetes solutions such as EKS, um, Google Kubernetes Engine or Azure. And uh, this is what this talk will be focused about. So it's actually for you if you are interested in building any persistent service on top of Kubernetes and it pr probably even more uh, if you are looking into uh, running across multiple different cloud vendors, seeing what the challenges were we faced and uh, what pitfalls you can avoid. Uh, with me today uh, is actually Chris here. So Chris is uh, also one of our engineers, but we'll introduce him just shortly. Uh, first, uh, myself, so Jörg Schad. Um, I'm the head of engineering at machine learning at ArangoDB. And uh, kind of my past has always been switching back and forth between building large scale infrastructure. So also back at Mesosphere, I had the pleasure of being one of the early uh, contributors to Kubernetes. So we actually worked on Kubernetes 1.0, which was probably more rebasing than coding, but those were pretty interesting and fun times. And uh, prior to that, I've already been in the database field with both my PhD and then as one of the architects of uh, over at SAP with HANA. And so right now I'm pretty happy that I can combine both those passions over here at ArangoDB, uh, working on, yeah, large scale distributed systems on top of Kubernetes. Uh, as mentioned, with me today is Chris. He's one of our developer relations engineers. And Chris, I believe you can actually best introduce yourself. Excellent. Alrighty, thank you. Yes, uh, as you said, my name is Chris Woodward. And uh, thank you again, Ben, and everyone for having us. Uh, I am the developer relations engineer at ArangoDB. Uh, I came to ArangoDB with uh, about 10 years of experience and a couple of different areas of technology and support, administration, and development. Uh, at ArangoDB, I get to work with our engineers on various development projects and do community outreach, as well as a, a big focus on just improving the learning and training experience uh, when getting started with ArangoDB. So uh, if you do have any questions or suggestions there, anything you'd like to see or maybe improved uh, at ArangoDB, feel free to at me at on Twitter or uh, message me on our community Slack with uh, Chris.AranguDB. Um, the next slide here, if I can. Uh, yeah, this is our Oasis team. I've actually also been able to work with this team on some projects as well, but they're they're kind of the rock stars of Oasis. They, they had to face a lot of the challenges that we'll be talking about today. Um, and just a, a great group. And yeah, this is our, our main Oasis team. Definitely worth a call out there. And next slide, please. And uh, if you're not already familiar with ArangoDB, ArangoDB is actually a scalable native multi-model database that takes you from graphs and beyond. Uh, kind of what that means is that you can model your data as a document, a key value store, and as a graph database all at the same time. Uh, the kind of benefit that brings to you working with a multi-model database means that your application can have all the features it needs while only needing to use a single database. Uh, this can dramatically improve uh, development time and operations uh, ease of use there. Um, and next slide, please. So knowing that what we are, our going to be, um, why, why do we care so much about some of these cloud technologies that Jörg was mentioning? Um, this is, you know, for us, it was big because we actually needed to put ArangoDB on Kubernetes. We needed this for our managed service, Oasis, which we'll be talking about as well. Um, and this was a, a big challenge for us because 
we, we were going to production, just like a lot of developers do day to day. This is something that we can now say we confidently can relate to. And uh, we, you know, we can, we can understand some of the challenges there because Oasis literally runs on these cloud technologies. Um, okay, and next slide. And uh, Oasis, if you aren't familiar with it as well, is our cloud managed service. Uh, it is uh, available on all the major cloud providers, including AWS, Google, and Azure. Uh, it is a fully managed service and it includes, it runs our enterprise version, which has some uh, extra features on top of the community version, including ironclad security that you don't get in the community version, which is perfect for enterprise use cases as well. Uh, and of course it is highly scalable. Um, and it is easily adjustable. If we take a look at our deployment configuration screen here, um, you can configure initially and come back and change deployment types and modes, as well as the different hardware configurations that you have available. And once you get this set up, we also offer a lot of examples that you can get familiar with just OrangaDB in general, uh, as well as get familiar with Oasis. And these examples include uh, everything from a fraud detection use case uh, getting started with our built-in search engine, Orongo Search, uh, as well as a really neat e-commerce use case, which shows data analytics with the Instacart data set. Uh, next, car, uh, next slide, please. And so Oasis is sort of why OrangoDB cares about these technologies because it's, it's, you know, it's part of our product, but why should you care? And you should care about OrangoDB as well as these cloud technologies um, because ArangoDB is there for whenever the inevitable happens with your application where you have new requirements or the requirements change or new features. Uh, that's where using a multi-model database comes in handy because now rather than having to learn a whole new database technology or, or you know, different technologies out there, you're just adding or updating your existing queries. Um, and that's the, the power of, of ArangoDB and multi-model. Whereas on the deployment side, things are evolving in the same way as well. Uh, and we've seen this with our customers as well, a trend towards containerization and using some of these cloud technologies. And that's why we make it as easy as possible to get started as well as to go to production um, by having simple things like being able to do a Docker pool and running a RongoDB with a Kubernetes operator. And uh, next slide, please. And actually, that's kind of uh, ending it for me. I will actually pass it back over to Jörg uh, to take it from here to dive a little bit deeper into some of the challenges that we did face when using some of these technologies and take it from there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris, for the introduction. Um, before we actually start into the kind of like more DevOps topic of how to leverage and how to build an application or how to deploy and manage an application on top of Kubernetes, even different Kubernetes uh, distributions, uh, just maybe one shout out to more the core backend programmers here. So uh, being able to deploy something on top of Kubernetes or any container solution uh, might also be uh, Nomad, uh, Swarm, uh, Mesos, or whatever you're thinking about, is actually that you it also changes the way in which you have to write a database or any persistent application in particular. So the one change we have been seeing in terms of like deployment towards Kubernetes, it actually also needs to reflect a lot of changes in our back because it's a more dynamic infrastructure. Like 10 years ago, uh, databases, you had those five servers somewhere, somewhere down in your basement and those five servers, they would run your database for the next years probably. Nowadays we see cloud and containers uh, out there. It's a way more volatile, way more dynamic environment where you might get uh, rescheduled because a pod is being restarted or Amazon is telling you that they actually need to restart that node for maintenance. Uh, Google is upgrading your Kubernetes uh, distribution or other things. So in general, as a database, uh, the infrastructure you run on has become more fluid and you actually have to reflect that uh, also in your database design. But as uh, Chris already mentioned, we actually try to encapsulate as much as possible 
of this management for you. And this is done by our managed service OASIS. Uh, most of this is actually just to give you the background for this talk to understand what we're talking about with like specific terms. But the high level architecture of OASIS actually split into two components. If you're familiar with kind of the core concept of Kubernetes, this is actually a pretty similar uh, approach. So we have the control plane managing all our different um, clusters out there. And so here we collect the central metrics. Uh, we have our data cluster operator for spinning up new data clusters. We have our deployment handler. We have uh, all our logging, our alerting, and of course, and also the metrics uh, we actually need for uh, charging later on. So um, the data clusters themselves, they are the kind of uh, actually in this uh, case, Kubernetes clusters running our a Rango DB deployment. So each deployment is corresponding to at least a three node cluster. And so the data clusters are basically the backends running the actual workload. So if you want to kind of compare that to the Kubernetes node, each pod in Kubernetes uh, would be like one of uh, the pods for ourselves. Uh, what would be one a Rango DB cluster in our terms and each data cluster would kind of correspond to a worker node in Kubernetes. Um, and uh, so for us, we actually have a number of data clusters. So first of all, they are spread out across different cloud providers and also across different regions per cloud provider. So roughly you can think about, we got uh, one data cluster per cloud provider per region, uh, sometimes even more for like uh, privacy concerns, uh, testing clusters and other things. The control plane, as mentioned, is kind of the brain. It's also running in a managed Kubernetes, uh, in this case on Google infrastructure, and it's responsible for all the dashboards, uh, the actual creation of new data clusters and the management of data clusters. And furthermore, it's the only communication hub for data clusters for the rare cases where they actually have to communicate. Uh, this is not often, but all communication is basically going through the control plane and data planes aren't talking to each other directly. The data clusters, uh, they are the running the actual cl uh, customer deployments. And as mentioned, we got a number of data clusters per cloud provider per zone. And the goal of a data cluster is to, of why we introduced the concept of a data cluster is to actually abstract away the cluster details. Uh, and in cluster details, also abstract away the cloud provider details that we don't have to care from the control plane, whether this is actually running on Google or whether this is actually running on Amazon infrastructure. This mostly works. This is what the remainder of this talk is going to be about, where it doesn't work, uh, but we'll see uh, how that's uh, going. Um, so why should you care again? And uh, this again comes down to Kubernetes actually provides a pretty good abstraction. If we had to build all of this across uh, random infrastructure, it would have been way more work. And this has already been the promise when containers were introduced. So the container concept, probably all of you are familiar with that, but the idea is I can just simply run that container the same way on anything supporting that infrastructure. And this has been also kind of the motivation when containers were introduced in the real world where we can deploy a container onto a train, ship, uh, truck, uh, because it's a standardized uh, interface. Uh, the next level to actually get something meaningful out of containers is container orchestration. By itself, if a container is failing, there's no one there who will restart it. Uh, if we need to scale or actually assign resources to it, we need a layer called, usually referred to as container orchestration. Nowadays, this is often used synonymous with Kubernetes because Kubernetes has become the default container orchestration layer, but there are actually others out there as well. Uh, what are the different responsibilities for the container orchestration layer? First of all, it's managing the containers. This can go from uh, scaling up if I uh, need more of the same instances of a container uh, or also like restarting a failed uh, container or a failed pod in Kubernetes uh, if we had hit some quota or some error here. 
Second big responsibility is the resource management, making sure that we don't overload certain resources by too many or too large containers, uh, and uh, then actually take down uh, that particular server or overload that particular server. The last and probably most important, but also most challenging aspect for container orchestration is the server management where we need to go in and actually connect multiple containers into a meaningful service and this includes uh, topics like service discovery uh, networking or also network segregation so um, this is so with this as second abstraction layer aka container orchestration or kubernetes we can actually run our containers across all different infrastructures without having to worry how to deploy it we can have the same scripts for scaling them and all seems well but if we actually take a deeper look into kubernetes itself there are many moving components in there. So just from like a high level perspective, there is the master nodes, which correspond to the control plane. There's the worker nodes co corresponding to the data plane. And uh, those workers, they're the ones doing the actual work. And then on top, we got uh, the kind of state store at CD uh, managing the state. Challenge comes in uh, that we not only have to deploy and manage one of those Kubernetes clusters, but a former colleague of mine used to say Kubernetes clusters are like Pringles, you can't just have one. So typically you end up with a number of different Kubernetes clusters. As mentioned for us, we got one Kubernetes cluster per cloud provider per region, and that's just for the production system. Uh, you will also have different clusters for your test. Uh, and for your staging system, maybe even for your development system. So in a typical setup, you'll probably end up uh, with somewhere beyond five different Kubernetes clusters. And if you want to go the multi cloud provider uh, road, which we are going here, you'll probably even end up with more. Uh, so it's somewhere an open ended challenge or an open ended number of Kubernetes clusters to mention. And so for that, we want to uh, deploy and manage all those different uh, instances we've seen in the architecture ourselves. Luckily, there's uh, yet another abstraction layer or an abstraction help for us. And this is the managed Kubernetes uh, services offered by the different cloud providers. Meaning we don't have to set up Kubernetes ourselves. It's a few clicks or just, again, a short YAML, a short Terraform deploy. Uh, and this is going to set us up with an entire new uh, Kubernetes cluster. Sounds great so far. But naturally, the next question comes, why don't we just pick like, for example, EKS, Google, or Azure as kind of our only target? So why does someone actually need to do that across multiple cloud providers? And uh, this is actually the, for us, the most important reason is this is demand by our customers. And they have different reasons for uh, demanding this or requesting this. And often this is company policy. So this can either be in or exclusive. So for example, as Amazon might be a competitor, if you're yourself somewhere in the retail space, you might choose not to run your workload on top of AWS infrastructure. Other reasons might include privacy requirements, uh, especially with like GDPR or CCPA on the rise, where you might have certain rules that your cluster might or your data is not allowed to end up somewhere in US uh, or somewhere in Asia, depending on your company rules. For other uh, users, the reason is to avoid a single vendor dependency or to achieve more flexibility. The last reason, unfortunately, is also a very common one. And uh, I would just refer to that as uh, a CTO has read in some nice magazine that multi-cloud provider strategy is the new way to go. And so this is often also just kind of like a buzzword which needs to be checked out from some list where I would actually urge everyone to really consider that because it's a pretty big investment in terms of uh, resources, knowledge, and also maintenance over time. So what were the challenges we faced uh, by deploying our services across different cloud providers? And so kind of the overview is resource handling, 
different Kubernetes versions or the version handling by the different cloud providers, security with authentication authorization, uh, logging, networking, storage, and then different container runtimes. These are only the, I would say, kind of critical ones or most important ones. If you actually yourself have experienced other ones or you have any questions of what else we saw or faced out there, please uh, ping either Chris or myself. Uh, we are happy to either answer or forward your questions. So first blowing off some steam. So if we had to write an email to each of the managed cloud uh, provider solutions, this would probably be some of the content. Uh, just before writing that uh, email, uh, trust us, we are pretty happy with all of them and it's been great working with all of them because they take off a lot of work of managing Kubernetes from our plates. We're actually pretty happy about them despite they all kind of have their own perks and their own challenges. So if we are starting with Amazon EKS, so one of the probably biggest challenge we face is here the resource handling where AWS is creating a number of resources on the fly, load balancers, security groups, et cetera. And uh, this, this dependency chain uh, is sometimes hard to manage because removal has to occur in a certain order and also not all resources are tagged by default. So we kind of had to trial and error until we had like a decent and fail safe uh, scripts to actually remove clusters later on. Uh, the second aspect is that uh, EKS being one of the uh, mature solutions out there, it actually also shows in some of the age, especially with the error handling, which let's just say it's not as structured as it could be. So our error handling here actually involves a lot of string parsing to determine the actual error cause. Um, for Google, probably the biggest pain point we face is a rather aggressive update policy for the Kubernetes clusters. So Google is very much on the forefront if it comes to new Kubernetes solution, uh, Kubernetes uh, versions, which is great for us because we can always test the new versions. But then on the other hand, they are also rather aggressive in deprecating all the versions which acts uh, that they will force an upgrade at a certain point. And if you are running uh, any persistent service, even though we can handle a Kubernetes upgrade underneath uh, seemingly, um, to uh, any of the upper end stuff, this is still something we want under our control. So we don't want the Kubernetes upgrade to overlap with the database upgrade. We uh, want to keep that in certain maintenance windows where we actually we can monitor that, that to happen like uh, late at uh, middle of the night when all of our engineers are sleeping and uh, this would only wake the on call if something goes wrong. So uh, this is where we have to cut and make sure that we are always on top of uh, the latest version here. Uh, for Azure, it is actually, it feels in some aspect the lead least mature of these three big clusters, missing some simple features and uh, issues around the uh, persistent uh, volumes and also about the VM skill sets. So this has actually improved quite drastically over the past months, uh, but there are always those small quirks where we kind of really have to give a shout out to the team is that the Azure team is super responsive and super helpful in adding that. So uh, it's, uh, we are really curious and we are really happy in the way this is developing. So uh, the first topic um, is resource creation and resource handling. And we already talked about uh, what we, the challenges we are having here on the Amazon EKS side. And maybe just to uh, showcase how many different resources are created. So for each Kubernetes cluster, we actually have a large number of different resources here. So we got the VPC, we got an internet gateway, we got a NAT gateway, we got subnets, we got routing tables, security groups, auto scaling groups, uh, own AMIs, and then the actual EKS cluster. And again, there are like certain dependencies in which they can be removed and in which uh, we have to identify them because they are not necessarily all tagged if they are created as a dependency of something else. With Google, those are actually less resources. So we got a VPC, 
the actual uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster, and then the different node pools used for scaling. And this is actually pretty similar on the Azure side uh, where we got uh, resource groups, uh, the, um, the M scale sets, and then a storage account. So uh, again, this uh, is pretty easily manageable. The only challenge we faced here on the Azure side is that some of those resources uh, cannot be uh, scaled to either zero, which we sometimes use to actually pause a certain cluster. And also the number of VM scale sets used to be limited to eight. So this has been lifted by now, but some of the limitations is actually rather short uh, or rather low on a per account level, whereas uh, which actually limits us if we are creating many clusters across different uh, regions. Kubernetes versions. As also mentioned, this is actually mostly an issue or a challenge. I wouldn't really call it an issue, actually. We have with Google uh, Kubernetes engine because they are moving really quickly, both major and minor upgrades. But this is just also leading to forced upgrade. Uh, so it both has a good and a bad side for us. Um, Kubernetes clusters in general. Uh, so uh, the uh, cool thing is actually having a managed solutions. It's great because it will actually move a lot of uh, management burden from our shoulders, but it also comes kind of at at a cost. So the cost is like less, less flexibility. So for example, especially access to Kubernetes API server options when starting them up. So there are certain command line options we sometimes would like to have. We have when we bring up a cluster ourselves, but as the managed Kubernetes solution doesn't expose them, we simply don't have access to them. And so for example, one which will also come up when we talk about RC is like the authorization webhook config uh, parameter. We actually understand that ourselves simply because uh, we are also building our own managed uh, database service on top. And we also choose to not export uh, all little tiny detail parameter, but only the parameters we feel are most critical to customers. And uh, also the kind of like sensitive ones, uh, we try to kind of hide because uh, we also need to like limit ourselves to what we can test in the end and safe, safely support in the end. So we kind of understand the limitations here from, so we're doing similar things, but on the other hand, it also uh, sometimes is very annoying not to have access to all the different options. Authentication and authorization. Here, each cloud provider kind of has its own solution. And there also exist a number of open source and proprietary solutions. We were a bit shocked when we researched different open source solutions, how insecure they are underneath. So if you actually look at something, you we would just give you the recommendation to actually look at the code. And uh, some of the other proprietary solutions where we couldn't even do the code check also didn't meet our requirements because they were kind of like targeted to like a very either just one single organization and not a multi-tenant use case uh, or other reasons. And then uh, again, the issue is that we don't have access to all the API server options. So uh, some of these also simply don't work in such environments. So our solution right now is uh, Kubernetes service accounts for basically anything on the Kubernetes side, plus with this very simple layer of Oasis authentication on top, leveraging the service accounts underneath. Next challenge is uh, logging and audit logs. Again, here each cloud provider kind of comes up uh, with a proprietary solution. Uh, we've looked at a number of open source contributions here and what we really feel right now, and we're also pretty happy having that run for like all, now almost one year in production is Grafana Loki, um, which uh, really serves as well as kind of like a central uh, place to grab all our logs in, in the same fashion with the same API. Audit logging still is a specific topic. Um, so we offer audit logging or we support audit logging on kind of two layers. First of all, the kind of Kubernetes or Oasis layer uh, down to the actual infrastructure. And then also the audit log from a RangerDB itself uh, where each database access can be uh, locked and uh, retraced who triggered that. Uh, 
So the challenge here is that we actually need some stable storage outside. Uh, at best, we would like immutable storage. And uh, there again, cloud providers have very different options, which we'll see on the next slide when we talk about storage. So um, here, uh, first of all, the uh, first challenge was for kind of the database storage or the database volumes running the actual databases is that different cloud providers have rather different performance concepts. So for example, uh, even within one cloud provider like AWS, you've got some volume types supporting configurable IOPS uh, and in general, the performance characteristics. So we ran pretty extensive benchmarks on that. We're pretty pretty uh, different, let's just put it this way. And so we needed some experimentation to actually offer similar performance uh, ranges across different cloud providers. So uh, one issue we hit on uh, Azure, and I just put that here not to kind of like blame Azure, Chris has said we are actually pretty happy with them, but just to show like some of the uh, little uh, quirks we en encountered where we see that uh, the maturity right now is rising. And so, for example, that was like that the PVC resizing, the persistent volume claim resizing was broken. Uh, they changed the metadata when you resized one and the pricing uh, also reflected that, but there were no changes in the file system. The team was super supportive and they actually supported it with a manual workaround. Uh, and uh, so now uh, we are actually there. If you're an Azure itself, uh, that also is not an issue for you, but if you're an AKS, uh, I think by now it's also been fixed and we could move away from the workaround. Uh, so thanks to the Azure team for their support. The second part is actually cluster external storage. So we not only need volumes for the database itself, but also for storing backups, for storing audit logs. So basically anything outside the database and also external to the cluster, or external to the cluster, meaning independent of the life cycle of the cluster. And again, here each cloud provider has proprietary solution. And uh, currently this unfortunately forces us to have multiple implementations because the S3 interface for example, differs greatly from uh, the other interfaces. The next big topic you should actually look at uh, is uh, wherever you deploy a Kubernetes cluster is uh, networking. So especially for us, as we are running a uh, multi-tenant uh, setup, we really want strict separation from deployments from each other, but also of course separate the uh, deployments. So the customers, the tenants from like our own platform. And so the challenge here is that uh, each data cluster actually, it's being one Kubernetes cluster, needs to be placed inside one VPC. And so we, makes it a bit harder to leverage yeah, VPCs for a network segregation. But uh, luckily, uh, there are a number of different uh, great networking solutions now available for Kubernetes. And the solution we hear for is Cilium. Uh, there, the others are also great, just from our experimentation, which happened around one and a half years ago. Uh, this was actually the one which met our requirements best. Uh, We've been following the other ones and uh, must say like by now, probably all of them are pretty in a pretty good shape. So kind of the promise is, and this is what we are looking for is you can also replace Cilium with your favorite tool is to actually enable network policy rules. So for example, pods, uh, or in our case, like pods running database service in namespace A, can talk to pods in namespace B, but not vice versa. So uh, we can either allow or forbid traffic explicitly. And uh, those rules are uh, in, uh, implemented using BPF or eBPF. And so we actually also have the performance we need for that. In theory, this is cloud provider independent. So this works the same way. We can have the same rules across all cloud providers. The only thing which significantly differs between cloud providers is the setup actually. So here to set up Cilium, we actually have uh, different scripts for the different data clusters, uh, depending on which cloud provider that is. But again, this is the reason why we actually have that abstraction layer uh, called data cluster. So the reality, if it works, it's great, uh, but the cloud provider independence, it's 
mostly there and it's getting better with each version. So for example, pre Cilium 1.7, uh, there was the issue that pod siders were set differently across different cloud providers, which could actually mean that we ended up with colliding pod siders uh, on, uh, on, on AWS. And so our kind of impression was at the beginning uh, that they used mostly Google for testing, but uh, then in, uh, included like just minor testing for AWS. This is just our theory. And all, again, this is not to kind of like blame or shame any of these solutions. It's just one of those challenges you should be aware about uh, just because you test one tool uh, on one cloud provider and it should just work across all of them. You should actually test all the tools across all different cloud providers. So it's still great. So after seeing all of this, you might actually wonder, hmm, I don't want to run with any of those cloud providers. Will I still have the same problem here? So if we are looking at the on-prem kind of distributions for Kubernetes, so uh, I checked, I think this was like a three, four days ago, there were 68 different certified Kubernetes uh, distributions by CNCF and uh, they also all kind of go for different uh, tools being included. It's probably not gonna be such a big problem as if you have to compare it between different cloud providers, because most likely you'll choose one of those distributions and stick to that. Uh, but still uh, you should be aware that moving between those different uh, Kubernetes distributions, despite them being certified, might actually yield similar problems uh, than uh, we faced when moving between different cloud providers um, on uh, between different cloud providers. So will that get better in the future? So the progress we are seeing, so for example, with the tools, with the different cloud providers getting more mature, we believe, yes, it will get better, but uh, there will also be new challenges. So for example, a field we are currently tracking quite a bit is, I would call it container runtimes. Uh, I'll split that up a, a bit more uh, in a second. So just to structure that a bit more. So actual container runtimes. And then the second field, which I would kind of label secure container uh, containerization tools, uh, where we are following this area because A, we want to be more efficient in terms of uh, what we run. So that's why we look at different container runtimes, uh, but also, uh, the secure container uh, options like Firecracker, Kata Container, GVisor, Nabla, they're being introduced uh, to kind of bridge this gap between uh, the flexibility and uh, low resource footprint of containers uh, and then the true isolation properties of uh, virtual machines. And as we running multiple tenants uh, with actually sensitive data on, uh, on a platform, we are really interested in efficient isolation between different tenants. And this is of course why we are also following this. And so what we are kind of seeing here is that different cloud providers, Google kind of pushing for Gvisor, Amazon pushing more for on the firecracker side, uh, IBM uh, highly involved in Qatar. And so different providers are actually pushing for different options here. And so I believe this is still gonna be interesting where we will end up in 2021 uh, with those different container runtimes and also secure containerization options. Uh, with this, this actually brings us uh, to the end of our talk. And so kind of if we had to summarize our, our experiences, and again, this is kind of like a gut feeling, so uh, uh, take it with a grain of salt. AWS is clearly the older, uh, older cloud uh, compared to GCP or Azure, and especially the API is show showing some age. On the other hand, this maturity also results in uh, stability. So for example, if we compare network outages uh, across the different ones or just overall stability, Amazon is actually doing pretty great. Um, if we look at managed uh, Kubernetes solution, uh, Google actually uh, has a pretty strong offering with like very nice shiny APIs. Uh, but um, we are missing some of the features uh, which uh, Amazon is offering being the 
let's call it more mature cloud uh, out there. Um, what we are seeing with Azure, it's less mature, but it's actually catching up rather quickly. So we are really curious in uh, following this and seeing where they end up and are pretty happy with the progress here. So uh, with that, thanks for listening. Uh, I would leave a few minutes uh, now for questions, but uh, also feel free to reach out with any feedback or questions to either Chris, myself, uh, a RangoDB, or if you just want to try out a RangoDB being an open source database, you can either contribute or just start by doing a simple Docker pull of RangoDB and start using multi-model as your database. Uh, any questions in the chat or anywhere else, Chris, feel also free to uh, shout in any questions. I haven't seen any questions. Oh, looks like Helen had a question. I saw a hand go up. Um, we've got one from uh, Krishna as well. How do you manage multi-cloud providers? Can you specify the question a bit more? So which aspect of managing do you mean? So uh, as, as I think the takeaway kind of, uh, of of this talk is like Kubernetes is really helping us to abstract away a lot of the details. And then again, manage Kubernetes helps us to again, abstract away details from Kuben managing Kubernetes. Uh, but on the other hand, different choices and different uh, tool support, uh, external tool support uh, might lead to some of the challenges that it's not all fully abstracted away. And we have another question. Uh, how do you manage Kubernetes configuration? Ah, that's, uh, that's a good question. So uh, we actually have that uh, version as well. And uh, we only change that between different upgrades. And this is currently managed. We ha actually have written an own operator. I think there was already today a talk about operators. Uh, for basically deploying that and setting that up. We looked a lot at different uh, kind of solutions from Terraform over other things, uh, but the operator basically reading those config files uh, ended up being the most flexible and most stable solution for us here. Excellent, and next one, did you ever consider COPS instead of EKS to run K8 in AWS? Yes, uh, we looked at that. And again, there is the uh, argument right now is, uh, is uh, that A, we, we have the intro, uh, quite a good uh, working infrastructure in place. And we started when COPS was still kind of coming up, uh, but it's, it's still a topic which we might change uh, at some point. It's just currently not our biggest pain point here. Excellent. All right. Pretty good questions there. One minor interruption. There are three minutes left. Three minutes left. Thanks. Any final questions we have? Would you two like to uh, shout out your uh, social media or contact information one more time? Uh, sure, yeah, reach me uh, on our community Slack, chris.arangodb, or you can find me at Twitter with uh, C Woodward with uh, zeros in place of the O's and the A's. And yeah, uh, Jörg Schad on Twitter uh, and also in the community Slack. This is one advantage of my name that uh, it's pretty easy to find. So if you are on our community Slack, I just look for Jörg and you should be able to find me. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, well, yeah, one last one. Uh, I know you talked about logging aggregate, aggregation with Grafana. What about metric monitoring? Are you using Prometheus CloudWatch or something similar? So uh, we use Prometheus. Currently, we're actually evaluating uh, how to combine. So currently, our setup is actually that we have one Prometheus setup for each cluster. And currently, we are 
actually evaluating how we can pull all of this uh, together into one big uh, instance or one central instance. And this is actually a really interesting development. So there are two main projects we are looking in. And I believe if I looked correctly at the schedule, there's actually also uh, an own talk about that. And uh, we'll probably uh, give an update because that decision hopefully is gonna come soon, uh, whether how we're gonna standardize on or centralize our uh, metric server. So it's still, it's basically just uh, which centralized solution are we going to go for?